Man, thanks, Pastor Angie, and good morning to all of you out there. And as Pastor Darren mentioned, uh, yes, uh, somehow, some way, I have graduated from seminary. So that's exciting to be at that point now. And uh, when people ask me, "Oh, where'd you do your seminary studies at?" I go, well, "I went to Bethel," and they go, "Wait a minute, you went to Bethel? Like the Bethel from Amos chapter four, verse four? And I'm going, Amos chapter four, four. So I go into the Bible. And the first thing I read in Amos chapter 4, 4 is this, go to Bethel and sin. <laughs> I did not go to seminary to do that. And I also didn't bring my sacrifices every morning and my tithes every three years. That's also a part of that verse. But um, no, I had a wonderful experience as a part of Bethel and as a part of Master's Institute and also as a part of Community of Grace. So I want to thank all of you as well for being my church home and it's grateful to um, be here with you once again and to be able to share the good news of the gospel with all of you. It's really, really exciting. And here we are, we have reached the, the ending point, if you will, of our sermon series titled Social Distancing. For the past few weeks, we've been looking at the book of James. And even before this pandemic happened, I had an interest in looking at the book of James because I had always found that it was a book of wisdom. But I've been truly blessed to be able to learn what the book of James has been communicating. Because a lot of times when people read the book of James, they find that its message is saying that if you do these things, you'll be seen as righteous in the eyes of God. But if we take a little bit deeper look into the book of James, we find that it actually doesn't contradict the rest of Scripture, but it does align perfectly with how God has communicated all throughout the Bible. And the theme that we've been looking at in the book of James is that we are to love God and love neighbor under the shadow of the cross right where we are located. And just as a reminder, we've been looking at right where we are located because these are difficult times and these are times where we're turning in all sorts of different directions and we can get confused and we can get hurt in the process. And so the question becomes, where is Jesus in all of this? And where do we turn to when these times get difficult. In the very first week, I want to, we emphasized that it was faith that was the basis for all that we do. When we put our faith and trust in who Jesus is and what he does, that then produces fruit to then go out and love our neighbor. And what this is, is that this is an ideal. This is something that if this were a perfect world, we would be in perfect relationship with God. We would not, we would not know such a thing as sin and we would just be doing all the right things at all the right times and in all the right places. But unfortunately, time and time again, we keep going back to our old ways of living. We keep going back to what we want and what we desire in life. We're people who can fall into the trap of individualism very, very easily. And we adopt this mindset. I like to call this mindset the are you smarter than a fourth grader mindset. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a TV show called Are You Smarter Than a Fourth Grader? And basically, these people who are older than fourth grade and who have been through more education than a fourth grader are brought onto this TV show to answer questions that are basic to a fourth grader's education. And it's always funny watching these people who, some of them have master's degrees, trying to answer these questions, and they're, you know, fumbling over their words and trying to be like, what that, the answer is. And then the fourth grader, who they're going up against, answers it just like that. And I used to look at this show, and I'd be like, huh, that's funny. That would never happen to me. That is until we started having our refuge, our student ministries, over Zoom. And one night in particular, we decided to have a trivia night for our high school students. And it, it's been a really great time to be able to con continue to connect with our high school students and our middle school students during this time, because they especially have been going through a lot and are also going through the same changes that we as adults are going through. So it's been important for us to be able to connect with them. And we connected through a trivia night. So all of the refuge leaders came together. We brought some questions that we thought would stump the high schoolers or that would be sort of a challenge and be a fun way to connect. And so we're going through these questions. Each leader is asking a different question. And at one point, one of our high schoolers, her younger brother, 
pops into the screen and does what any younger brother would do in a situation where you're caught on camera. You start poking and annoying your older sister, and then you turn to the camera and go, ooh, what's going on on the computer screen? What's going on on the camera? I want to know. And of course, he's finding that we're playing a trivia game. Now, this next series of questions were over U.S. history, and this was my experience, at least. I don't know about your experience, but as I was going through school, I learned about U.S. history in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, in college, and yes, even in seminary to a degree. I had to learn about American Christianity. And so you would think that when these questions were asked about U.S. history, I would know them very, very well. And I came into this under the assumption that, yeah, I know U.S. history pretty well. But these questions were being asked, and I'm looking to my leaders on the screens, and they're looking back at me, and I'm going, uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But lo and behold, the younger brother of one of our students heard the question and raises his hand and goes, I know the answer. And of course, he answers the question, and it's correct. And so, in this initial time, we're like, okay, yay, you did good, good job, way to go, you answered a question right. So then we go to the next question, and again, it's under the category of U.S. history, and once again, all of the leaders are kind of looking at each other like, I don't know the answer to this, do you know the answer to this? And we're just struggling to find an answer. Younger brother comes on, I know the answer to that, and once again, answers the question correctly. And then we go on to a completely different topic, and once again, leaders are struggling to answer the question, and younger brother gets on, I know the answer to that, and lo and behold, we learned that yes, there is a possibility of a fourth grader being smarter than you are. In fact, I think he's in fifth grade, but either way, when our pride, when our wants, when our desires get challenged in this way, shape, or form, it can bring out some anger in us, and it can bring out the worst in us sometimes, and we can get jealous and we can get envious of each other. And James is writing, not necessarily to us, but he's writing to a group of Christians who they have been scattered from Jerusalem, and they've established these new communities in the surrounding areas. But the problem is, is that their pride had taken over, and there was fighting happening within these communities. I mean, who's ever heard of a fight in a church before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyways, there was fighting that was happening, and so James is trying to address this situation. And the way that he goes about it is by describing two different kinds of wisdom. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to James chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 13. So again, just as a reminder here, James is talking to people who are fighting with each other, who shouldn't be fighting with each other, and are letting their wants and their desires get the best of them. So this is what James responds with. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, spiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, we read a passage like this, and we think to ourselves, oh yeah, the second part of that sounds awesome. You know, I want to be a person who's peace-loving. I want to be a person who's considerate. I want to be somebody who's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. But I want to do it my own way. I want to do that without God. And then that falls into the category of the other kind of wisdom. The one that brings about bitter envy and selfish ambition. And James describes this as being double-minded. And what he means by that is that we're like people who have our foot in one camp and our other foot in the other camp. We have one foot in the heavenly wisdom, the stuff that we desire 
to be. We, like, we want to be people who are peace-loving. We want to be people who are considerate. We want to do good in this world. But then there may be like a foot or an entire half of a body or even a pinky toe that has its foot or that has its place in the wisdom of earth. And unfortunately, we can't be double-minded. No matter how hard we try, even if we have a lot of our body in the wisdom of heaven, if we have just a sliver of our, part, of our body in the wisdom of earth, it still affects us. It still has control over us. It still brings about that desire to do whatever it is that we want. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, of course I want to do what I want. I get joy out of doing what it is that I enjoy doing. And these evil practices can start to become patterns. At first, it's like you tell a lie. And when you tell that lie, you're thinking to yourself, okay, this lie feels pretty good. I avoided trouble. I avoided getting punished. Now, I could probably continue to lie, and I can continue to get good results. And this is the case with any evil practice. You do, you do it once, and you think that all is good. It might produce joy in the short term. You might get away with stuff in the short term, but the reality is, is that in the long term, those patterns start to become a part of your life. And when those patterns become a part of your life, then all of a sudden, without you maybe even knowing it, you're social distancing yourself from other people because they might see you as that's the person who lies all the time. You don't want to associate yourself with them. Or that's the person who they judge people on a regular basis. You don't, you don't want to be around them. They're just going to judge you, and they're going to look down on you. Or that's the person who they do this bad thing, and you don't want to associate with bad people. But not only does it socially distance you from other people, but it socially distances yourself from God because you're trying to do it your own way. And you, if it gets bad enough, you're to a point where you're asking yourself the question, where do I go from here? Now, throughout this series, we've been talking about the question of, is Jesus the answer? Is Jesus the answer to see the light at the end of the tunnel during this pandemic? And the answer is yes, Jesus is the answer because he's the source of our faith and the person who we put our trust in. Is Jesus the answer to tame our tongue? And the answer is yes. He's the one that speaks life into you and then you speak life into other people. And so once again, when we find ourselves succumbing to our selfish ambitions, is Jesus the answer to right the ship? And the answer is yes. And how we go about loving God is we go about it by way of confession. Now, with confession... It's something that we do in our worship services every single week. In our traditional services, it's got more of a liturgical feel, so it's more scripted, but yet the words are extremely powerful and extremely fruitful for our lives. And in our contemporary services, it's a little bit more free-flowing and it varies differently from time to time. But a part of confession each and every single week is that opportunity to be able to come to God and submit to God to let him know where we have gone off the beaten path. And when we do this, it's multifaceted. There's a number of different things that are involved when it comes to confession. When we confess, we adopt a posture of humility. James goes into this after he describes the two kinds of wisdom. How he describes it is he describes it as submission. He says in chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So it's an opportunity to encounter God. It's a chance for you to adopt a position of humility. And even before that verse, it says that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. God doesn't like when we come to him thinking that we have it all together or thinking that we're better than others or thinking even that we're on the same level as God. But it can also be the case where we come before God and we have our tail between our legs and our head is down in shame, thinking that, I don't think God can do anything about this. This feels like a hopeless situation. But yet, it says that God shows favor to the humble, to the people who recognize right, the situation that they're in 
or what they're dealing with or their pains or their burdens, and they bring them before the Lord. It's a chance to come clean. It's a chance for you to be vulnerable with God. You don't have to put up this mask when encountering God. He already knows each and every single detail about you. He knows where you have fallen short, but He doesn't judge you. He looks at you and He says, bring your burdens to me. Bring all that you are to me in a form of confession. So as we go about confession, we're actually going to do that at this time. So I'm going to invite Dan Lugo, our worship leader, up, and he's going to lead us in an intentional time of confession. And I want to encourage you during this time that as we're going through this, to think about your posture, to assume a posture of humility, and to know that you are in a safe space at your home or wherever you're watching from, and to know that God is going to work in your life, and that He wants to encounter you, and that He wants to draw near to you. So I encourage you to adopt that position and to open yourself to this time of confession. So Dan, take it away. Let's pray. Father God, we submit ourselves to you. We acknowledge that we don't deserve your forgiveness. You are perfect. You are righteous. You are holy. We are not. And yet we come seeking what we do not deserve because we know that you are just and you are good. You are righteous and you are kind. You are holy and you are merciful. So we come before you to find what we cannot give ourselves, to find forgiveness for the sins that we've committed against you and against others. We acknowledge our shortcomings. We acknowledge that we haven't gone as far as we should have in loving others. We confess that we measure out love in limited portions when you call us to pour it out generously. Have mercy on us, God. We confess the sins that we have that we hold on to, the pet sins that keep us comfortable. We acknowledge the judgment that we have for others who have different sins than us. Have mercy on us. We acknowledge and we confess that we do wrong and we're helpless to stop it. We confess that we don't do right and we're helpless to change our own hearts. And so we come seeking you, God, to receive you with open hands, to let go of the things we've been holding to so that we can receive your forgiveness and generously Give back and bless the world from your goodness. We accept the good news that through Jesus and his work on the cross, through his eternal work, we are forgiven by you. For all who call upon your name are received as sons and daughters and heirs of the promise of forgiveness and of salvation. So we look to you, God. We thank you that Jesus has done the work. And that your word tells us if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And we look to you to do that. God, make right in us what we cannot make right in ourselves because we try and we fail. But you restore us. Restore our hearts to feel and accept your goodness. Lift up our heads so we don't walk in shame. 
and open our eyes to see you who sees us as we truly are. Sinners saved by grace from a loving God. Church, if you have confessed with your mouth, believed in your heart, and believe that God has wiped away those sins from you. And so not by my authority, but by authority of Scripture. And by the God who loves you, know that in Christ you are forgiven. Receive that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Did you catch that? Did you catch that it's not just a one-way relationship? It's not that we only confess our sins and then nothing happens. Something happens when we bring our burdens and our pains to God. What happens is God encounters us. He draws near to us. He proclaims over us, you're forgiven. All the bad stuff you've done in the past, all the hurts, they're healed. You are forgiven. Let that truth ring true today. And it's not something that's just a one-time deal. This is something that we constantly need to do. We constantly need to bring our confessions before God. And when we do, every single time, God responds. And he responds with, you're forgiven. You are loved. I am who I am. It's all about Jesus. When we love God, we meet him through confession. And he responds by issuing a promise over us through absolution. So what does this all mean? We've been talking about this theme of how we are to love God and love neighbor under the shadow of the cross right where we are at. And it feels like all around us that just a, it just seems like this is going to go on and on and on and that maybe God isn't working during this time. But let me show you something. Brought back the whiteboard. Let me show you this. Down here is little stick figure you. There you are. You're right down there. And up here, I'm going to draw God like I did last week. Up here is God. And we, in our selfish ambition, try to get up to God. But no matter how hard we try, we just can't fully get there. But yet, God in his mercy sends Jesus down. And in this sort of gray space, if you will, in this sort of smudge, if you will, is where faith is happening, is where the process of refinement is occurring, where God is working in your life. Even when you don't feel it, he is working in that. And we consider this the vertical aspect of faith. But faith isn't just one-dimensional. You've got a neighbor over here and a neighbor over here who may not necessarily know the good news of what Jesus offers and who he is and what he does. And as we've learned, our faith is what produces good fruit, and our good fruit isn't meant for God, it's meant for our neighbors, for us to speak truth and to speak life and to get them connected to a God who loves them dearly. And throughout this entire process, the vertical aspect and the horizontal process, right here you see the shadow of the cross. It's there. It may not be explicitly said. James may not have ever alluded to it. But overshadowing all that James is saying is the cross, is where Jesus died for your sins, where he works in your life and is going to continue to work in your life. And it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic going on. It doesn't matter if the church buildings are shut down or if we have to be limited to 50 or 100 people moving forward or whatever the case may be. This is always the case. This is how we can live. We can live this cross-shaped faith no matter where we are. And we can live this right where we are located. Now, this all sounds great, but what's a tangible way that we can truly live this out in our lives? Again, I think James addresses this. 
And he addresses this through the closing of his letter. And I want to close by saying this. Usually when these, writer, these scriptural writers were ending their letters, these last words that they wanted the people to hear were meant to be the words that truly ringed in the ears of the listeners. And these are the words that James says to the people who have been scattered. In James 5, chapter 13, which is our scripture reading for today, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone, hung, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if, any, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And what James is describing here is that we are to intercede for one another. It's a fancy word for taking the place of another person through prayer. Because here's the reality. We're all broken. We're all sick in some way, shape, or form. And a lot of times in Bible studies or in small group settings, we can get focused on asking for prayer for physical healing, like praying that someone's cancer would go away or that somebody's surgery would go well. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for those things. We definitely should pray for those things. But we need to broaden our scope of how we can invite people to intercede for each other. Because there's more healing that is involved. Maybe it's a healing that's emotional. Maybe somebody is experiencing depression. Maybe somebody's experiencing anxiety. Maybe somebody's experiencing loneliness. And you can intercede for them in prayer, for God to show up in their lives and to provide a presence and a peace that is unexplainable. Maybe somebody's experiencing relationship sickness. Maybe things aren't going well with your spouse. Maybe you're having an issue with a friend. Pray for healing. Intercede on that regard. And you can intercede in any situation. It doesn't take an extraordinary person to intercede. What it takes is the prayer of a righteous person, and because we're justified by faith alone, it means we're all righteous, even though we're sinners. And because of the, we are righteous, that means our prayers are going to be powerful, and our prayers are going to be effective, and they're going to make a difference during these dark and difficult times. And that's how James concludes. To a people who were fighting in and amongst themselves and struggling to adjust to a new culture, James encourages them and exhorts them to pray for one another. And as we leave here today, I want to encourage you that throughout this week to listen to people, to hear where they are hurting, and to intercede for them. You can do this as a Bible study. You can do this on your own. But I want you to intercede for somebody in this congregation or somebody who isn't a Christian or somebody outside of this congregation, you could even intercede for three different people or more. But take this to heart. Know that this is the life that we are called to live and that Jesus shows us on a regular basis because we are people who are called to love God and love neighbor under the shadow of the cross right where we are located. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for how you have spoken to us during this sermon series. And I pray, Lord, that as we go about living life, that we would just be rooted in who you are and what you do for us. We pray that you would help us to turn aside our selfish ambitions and our envy and our jealousy of one another. 
and that we would bring them towards you. Lord, continue to work within our hearts. Continue to refine us. Continue to mold us. Continue to remind us again and again and again that we are enough, that you are enough, that you working in our lives is what brings beauty from ashes. So Lord, I just pray that during this time that we would walk away from this sermon series being filled up with how wonderful and peace-loving and gracious you truly are towards us each and every single day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.